Today, I, I want to read from John chapter 1, and I've got a message on my heart, believing the Lord is going to speak to us in a powerful way. The Bible says this, starting in verse 43 of John's gospel. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You shall see greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. I love this passage of scripture. And today on Easter Sunday, I wanna preach the next few moments if I can from the subject, can anything good come out of this? Can anything good come out of this? And this is a, a really powerful passage of scripture. This is the beginning of John's gospel. And John describes this beautiful story about Philip and then Nathaniel becoming disciples of Jesus. And the way that the story begins is that Jesus comes and finds Philip and says, follow me. I think it's important that we distinguish, even on Easter Sunday, that we've gathered a lot of people here, and we gather a lot of people here every Sunday, by the way. Uh, but we gather people here that we might leave here following Jesus. We don't just gather to be seen. We don't just gather to see other people. We gather that we might follow Jesus in a better way. That's what it means to be a disciple, by the way. It doesn't mean just to make a decision. It means to follow. But how many of y'all know when you follow someone, that can be dangerous at times? Uh, my wife, Dawn Shree, who is uh, my, uh, my wife now for, it'll be 18 years in August. Shout out to Dawn Shree. <laughs> Been together since we were 17. Uh, we travel a lot together. And Don Shree's told the story, but um, I've never gotten to tell the story. A lot of times when we're in airports, Don Shree's just following behind me, but she's just on her phone, you know, just doing her thing, pop, 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 buying stuff. Who knows what she's doing? <laughs> but I remember one time in particular, I'm just walking through the airport of London, and um, I walk right into the men's room. And I turn around, and my wife is standing right behind me at the urinal. I said, Don Shree, what do you think? She's like, oh my God, I'm sorry. And she excused herself. <laughs> You got to be careful who you are following, and you ought to know that when you start following Jesus, Jesus will take you to dangerous places. When you start following Jesus, a clear sign that you're following Jesus is that you will go to places you never thought you would go. You will do things that you never thought you would do. You will see things that you never thought you would see. Today on Easter Sunday, we're getting ready to host, I don't know, 10, 12 different services in four different locations. I don't know how we got here as a church. All I know is we keep following Jesus, and he keeps doing exceedingly, immeasurably more than we could ever ask, think, or imagine. If you don't know, yesterday in Liberty City at Charles Hadley Park, we gathered 5,000 people. And you say, Rich, what'd you do? We dropped 55,000 Easter eggs from the sky. Why? Because we're following Jesus. And when you start following Jesus, you start doing stuff that left to yourself you would never, ever do. But his message and his mission compels you to serve other people. I like how the text says that Jesus found Philip. Because I don't know where you come from today. I don't know how you got here, but let's make no mistake about it. A lot of times in church, we're like, I found God. 
I hear you, but that's not really what happened. We didn't find God. God was never lost. I was lost, but even in my lostness, God came and found me. Can anybody testify God found you? Watch this. Philip gets found by God, and now Philip goes out and he looks for other people. In Mark's gospel, when Peter and John are, are called by Jesus, Jesus says, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. If you're not fishing, I wonder, are you actually following? Because found people find people. If you're wondering what Voo Church is all about, we exist because we are a community that says we want to be a lighthouse. We want to be an outpost in the middle of Dade County, Broward County one day, right here in the city that would say people who feel like they're far from God, we exist to bring people who are far from God close to God. Why? Because all of a sudden found people find people. If you're not finding people, I wonder, are you still lost? Because immediately... Philip is found by God, and then the scripture says that Philip goes and he finds Nathanael. Now, let's be clear, because maybe you're here today, you're like, oh man, um, my friend invited me to church. Sort of. Sort of. God might have used your friend, but I think it was God who made the invitation. I think God found Philip so Philip could find Nathanael. This is a picture of what it is that we're doing. And when Philip found Nathanael, this is what he says to him. He says, we have found the one that Moses wrote the law about, about the one in whom all of the prophecies are about. Here comes Philip. He is convinced that Jesus is God, but he's speaking to a friend who has questions. And on this Easter Sunday, with the time that we do have, I believe that this room, for the most part, is made up of two categories of people. There are Philip's. People who are convinced that Jesus is who he said that he is. Then there's this other group of people that I would say that you are like Nathaniel. That maybe Jesus is who he said he is, but I got some questions. Nathaniel's question, well, his question is, Jesus from Nazareth? He says, Nazareth. What good could come out of Nazareth? Someone say Nazareth. I love Nathaniel because I think he is a picture of the human condition today. That so many times we want to believe, but our very own skepticism about who God is, what God should be like, and if there is a God, this is how he should behave, gets in the way. Nazareth, no. Come on, you're telling me the Messiah is from Nazareth? For Nathaniel, Nazareth is negative. It's negative because he's looking at it, he's going, there is no way that the Messiah, the Son of God, came from that place, from that town. Nazareth is, is interesting because um, I grew up in church, and I had one of those Bibles uh, that had the maps in the back. I should have studied them more, right? Um, I went to Israel a couple of years ago, and it really helped me tremendously because I, do kinda, I don't really do good with like you know South Florida geography, let alone Middle Eastern geography. But what you'll find out is that all throughout the Bible, many of us, we know certain places. We know the birthplace of Jesus, Bethlehem. Uh, many of us, we might even know the headquarters of where Jesus' entire ministry had operated out of. I've been there. It's Capernaum. Almost everyone on the planet has heard of the place where Jesus died, which is Jerusalem. But few of us really understand his hometown. The town in which Jesus grew up in is Nazareth. How many of you know, you can't really understand someone's story until you know the beginning of their story. For me, uh, I, I'm a dude who was born in Tacoma, Washington. And in 1998, my parents moved from Tacoma, Washington to Miami, Florida. And when I got to Miami, Florida, people looked at me like I was strange. However, I looked at them like they were even stranger. I got here my freshman year, and before you know it, my freshman year of high school, I had to sign up for salsa classes. Because <laughs> I had to go to these things called quinces. <laughs> I was introduced to food called jerk chicken. I'm telling you what, can anything good come from Tacoma? 
Can anything good come from Miami? Can anything good come from Hialeah? Can anything good come from Miami Gardens? Can anything good come from Little Haiti? Can anything good come from the Design District? Can anything good come from South Miami? So often it's our familiarity that breeds contempt. An idea that we despise something or think that it's insignificant. For Nathaniel, his question about God, the thing that was a barrier is that, hey, if this is really God, there's no way he could come from Nazareth. But let, let's be honest for a moment. It's not just Nathaniel who thought that Nazareth was negative. The entire culture thought that Nazareth was negative. If, if you study it a little bit, it's interesting. Theologians will talk about the fact that Nazareth in that time period uh, was almost like an expression of a, of a derogatory word, almost like a cuss word, that people would use it like, oh, my goodness, like eh. Nazareth, that, that's, that's, that's not a good thing. That's a bad thing. Imagine it as a, as a cuss word, like, oh, Nazareth, you know? That's some bull Nazareth, you know? <laughs> Nazareth, you, bro, you feel me okay? Like, it, it had, this, had this expression that it was less than. And even if it wasn't a cuss word, if we're not gonna go to that degree, it was the most basic place on the planet. It was a town of less than 200 people. It was small. It seemed to be insignificant. Uh, writers will talk about it almost kind of being like, like a hillbilly town. Y'all sound like you're from Nazareth, okay? That is the picture of this place. Yet what is interesting to note about Nazareth is that Nazareth was always a part of God's plan. Nazareth was prophesied about. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 1 speaks about the Messiah, the Son of God coming. And this is what it says. It says, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Would you believe me if I told you that Nazareth by definition means branch? Say, Rich, why are you saying that? I'm saying that because Jesus came from Nazareth as a part of God's plan, that he came from the town known as the branch because God was trying to show you and I that he is no respecter of persons or people, that what you think is small and insignificant, what you think is petty, what you think is bad or evil or not of use, God says, I can work through it and I can bring good out of it. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, they had to flee because there was this king named Herod who was trying to kill the Messiah. And so he ends up in Egypt. And after being in Egypt for a while, the angel of the Lord appears to his father, Joseph, and says, all right, now you can go back, but I want you to settle in the town of Nazareth because Jesus needs to be the Nazarene. This was a part of God's plan. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? The answer is undoubtedly yes, that God has a plan with all of our stories. Go throughout the Bible and you will discover that good things came out of bad places. Abraham came out of Ur. Moses came out of Egypt. Daniel came out of Babylon. Ruth came out of Moab. Rahab came out of Jericho. And Jesus came out of Nazareth. Job, he says it this way, who can bring what is pure from the impure? No one, no one except Jesus. Because this is what he does. Acts chapter three tells this story about a lame man who's begging, who cannot walk. And here comes Peter and John, and he's begging for money. And what do they say? They say, silver and gold I do not have. But one thing I give you, I give you the power of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Get up and walk. Come on, somebody, give God some praise. Get up and walk because there's still power in the God from Nazareth. This was a part of God's plan. Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? I love Philip. I'm coaching our church, and I'm also talking to the Nathaniels in the room. I love Philip, because Philip doesn't sit there and debate him. Well, let me just tell you, there's a problem. He doesn't do any of that. What does he say? He says, come and see. 
I think that's what Easter Sunday is about. Easter Sunday is an invitation to come and see. Come and see. Don't, don't, don't take my word for it. Just come and see. And listen to me. If you'll come into this place today and you'll open your heart up to God and say, Jesus, if you are real, reveal yourself to me. What I have learned time and time again is that he will do it. So Nathaniel gets up and goes with Philip, and when they approach Jesus, I love it, Jesus sees him in the distance, and he says, here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. The New King James Version says, in whom there is no guile. How do you know me, Nathaniel asked. And Jesus answered, well, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus came to us. I, I love this moment because this is what God does. God's word is so powerful that it somehow hits all of us in an intimate way. This little portion of the scripture is what I think that God wants to do in all of our lives, that he wants to meet you in a personal encounter, that he wants to reveal himself to you in a way that you wouldn't just hear about it from someone else, but you would know him intimately and personally. And what does Jesus say to Nathaniel that he says to all of us? What he says to Nathaniel that he says to all of us is he says, I saw you before you saw me. The Psalms says that Jesus watches us while we sleep. Sometimes I'll wake up and my wife's just looking at me. It's kind of scary. <laughs> you serve a God that when you're sleeping, he's still working. The Bible says he knows every hair on your head. Even if you had a hair transplant, he knows about those ones. Nothing goes missed. Nothing goes overlooked. This is a God who loves you. And long before you ever have faith in him, he has faith in you. I saw you before you saw me. And how did he see him in particular? He says, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathaniel, I saw you under the fig tree. And when Nathaniel hears this, he's like, wow, you are. You are the son of God, the fig tree. The fig tree. I like it because once again, this seeing him in the fig tree is very personal and intimate. I'm even praying right now, I've been praying this all weekend, that as I come up here to present this ancient text to you, that every one of us in this room that don't know Jesus, that he would begin to reveal himself, that something I'm gonna say, or there's gonna be a moment in the courtyard, or a moment in the parking lot, or somehow you're driving here, and somehow you're gonna have your own fig tree moment. I saw you under the fig tree. So when I read the Bible, I ask the Bible questions, like what is, why is this important, what does this mean? I think there's a couple things that stick out to me about this fig tree moment. Uh, the first thing about this fig tree moment is there is this expression in Judaism which says, um, let's take it under the fig tree. I have some Jewish friends and they made a joke the other day. They said, you can have um, two, two Jews together but you'll get three opinions. <laughs> I said, what does that mean? They said, well, the way that we're raised in, in our faith is that rabbis, as they begin to interpret and teach the Torah, we will find ourselves in deep, deep soul dialogue that it gets tiring. <laughs> we get overwhelmed. And so the expression is, take it under the fig tree means, let's take a break and let's find some rest. I love this picture because right away, we already know that Nathaniel is a good Jew. Number one, because Jesus said so. Here is a true Israelite, there is no guile, but also based upon the invitation. Most of us don't go around to Starbucks and say, hey, come to Voo this coming Sunday with me. I want you to meet the man that the entire law was written about. That's not usually your entrance point for an invitation, but it would be to somebody who's living under the law. I love the picture of a man sitting under the fig tree and Jesus saw him because it is a prophetic picture of a man who is carrying the weight of the law, looking for rest. And that rest only comes from the Savior. His name is Jesus. Oh, I feel like preaching a little bit. I know it's the first service, but God's going to speak to us today. But it's not just that. I think better than reading the Bible is doing the Bible. That's why I like new Christians so much, because they don't know everything the book says. They just start doing the little parts of the book that they already know. And what I love is that there's this Old Testament prophecy found in Micah chapter 4, verse 4. Listen to this. Everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid, for the Lord Almighty has spoken. 
Get the picture of Nathaniel. Nathaniel isn't just a hearer of the word, he's a doer of the word. He is sitting under a fig tree as a prophetic picture that he is believing and actively walking out the very thing that he is waiting for God to do. I'd say it this way. You should be living like what you're waiting for. If you're waiting to get in school, start living like a student. If you're waiting to get a job, start living like a person who's disciplined with a schedule. If you're waiting to get married, start living like a person who understands commitment in relationship. This man is living under the fig tree, waiting under the fig tree because he's saying even though in this time of oppression and even though in this time of uncertainty and even in this time when we are not popular or even celebrated, I'm going to sit under this fig tree unafraid. He's living out the law. And Jesus says, I saw you under that fig tree. Before you saw me, I saw you. But what I want to ask you today is, is that many of us, like Nathaniel, are trying our best, are using all of our effort and all of our energy, trying to keep the law, trying to be a moral person, many times never realizing that the law was never given to save you. The law was given to you that you might recognize your need for a savior. Do you know that you need a savior? Because here's Nathaniel, and he's trying to keep up with all of the morals and trying to have the good behavior and trying to have the dialogue and even walking out the text under the fig tree. But all the while, he doesn't recognize there's one that's come to save him from himself. It's funny because um, I love I love our city and I love our church and I, I get the chance to, to walk around Miami sometimes, and so many people, as I walk around the city of Miami, will come up to me and say, Pastor Rich, y'all, we, we love you, man. We love what you're doing at VU. And I, I'm always really, really grateful for people that come up to me, and up to this point, no one really comes up to me and says mean stuff to me or hurls insults at me, although if you read the book, it's gonna happen at some point. But one of the things that grieves my spirit is how many times people will come up to me, and when they come up to me, within a minute, I can already tell that they don't know what they believe. Pastor Rich, so good to see you, man. Oh, bro, I love it, bro. No, 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 here's the thing, though. I'm not religious, but I am spiritual, okay? What does that mean? You do know there's this thing called evil spirits. You do know if you're not praying to Jesus, then who are you praying to? I, I, I've had two different encounters in the last four weeks. This is no disrespect to anybody. I'm just going, do you know what you believe? Two different people on two different occasions the last four weeks walked me, Pastor Rich, oh my goodness, what's up, bro? Good, oh my, this is so good to see you, man. I can't believe you're out here. You shopped too, that's crazy. Oh. <laughs> I didn't know you ate. I didn't know you left the house, but it's good to see you, man. It's like, yeah, dude, what's up? Um, I've had two different people the last four weeks just going, yeah, man, no, I'm not religious, but man, I love you, uh, but, I'm, but I'm, I'm, I'm in Ramadan right now. No disrespect to any faith. But, yo, if you're a Christian, you know you don't fast with Muslims and study the Quran. Like, what, what's going on? Like, do you, what do you believe? Uh, not so long ago, I got invited to go and speak at, at a friend's Shabbat dinner. It was quite a privilege, quite an honor, but I sat there talking to people. And I'm not disrespecting anybody. I'm just talking to our church for a moment. I'm talking to these successful people, these affluent people and influential people and I'm talking to them that go through all the customs and all the motions of the rituals and celebrate the Sabbath and I said well, what is it you believe like what do you think about the afterlife and what do you think happens after this and this guy sitting next to me just says well I just really believe in being a good person and I said well, what does that mean how do you define being a good person I could give you the law which is pretty universal the Ten Commandments don't murder, don't steal, don't envy. You know the law. Well, have you ever broken the law? Yeah. Well, then you got a problem. Because you're not good. In fact, Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says it this way. For all, someone say all. I looked up the word all in Greek. Guess what it means? All. 
everybody, all four locations, even those in the additional seating, even those right here on the front row, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us measure up. None of us can do enough good works. None of us will ever be good enough. We need a Savior. Do you know what you believe? Because Easter is not the great gathering of the frozen chosen. It's not the great gathering of those that look the part. Easter is the great gathering of people who know that they're weak. Who know that they don't measure up. I could never fast enough. I could never read enough. I could never do enough good things. Because when I go back to that law, it drives me to my knees. I love it. Because when Jesus saw Nathaniel, this personal moment under the fig tree, Nathaniel goes, oh, wow, you are the son of God. But here comes Jesus' response back to Nathaniel. He says, man, do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? <laughs> you shall see greater things than that. He added, I tell you the truth, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. I love Jesus because he's getting to the heart, I think, of even what our culture is today. I think we live in a mystical time. I'm a spiritual man. Yeah, no, I, there's something out there, bro. I, I, the vibes, the energy, whoa. Ooh. Bro, you got me at the end there when the key, that was... I, I grew up in a tradition that loves signs and wonders. I believe in signs and wonders. I believe in it. I believe in miracles. Yet many times, I think our faith is shallow because we believe if we have more signs and wonders or more supernatural phenomenons then more people would believe. Here comes Jesus. He's saying, you believe because I saw you in the victory? That was, that's easy for me. But you're going to see something greater than this. I long for our church to see signs and wonders. I just hope that we don't long for signs and wonders and miss the very fact that you, my friend, are a sign and a wonder. Do you know what the odds are of you being here right now today? Like just your existence. You are a miracle. You want to be impressed? Study your eyeball. You want to be blown away? Just get one coat of your DNA and you're going, whoa, there is a designer somewhere. Who is this architect? Who put this together? Wow. I long for signs and wonders as long as we as a community can mature and recognize that he's already done amazing, incredible, phenomenal, over-the-top, way-making, chain-breaking types of things. Did you hear Zach's story today? What are you waiting for? The man tried to hang himself and the rope broke. I never even heard of a rope breaking. But on this moment, the God of heavens and the universe snaps the rope because he's a God who's always working miracles. And I love it because he says, you're gonna see something greater than this, Nathaniel. I'm glad that this fig tree moment started your faith. But see, many times your faith will begin when you recognize that God sees you. But in order for your faith to mature, you're going to have to see God for who he is. Because he says this greater thing's coming. And what this greater thing is, is if you'll come on this journey, Nathaniel, what you're going to see is you're going to see that I came for you. You're going to see that you're not good enough. You'll never be good enough. You could never measure up. And that is why I will go to a cruel, rugged cross. And nails will be put in my hands and nails will be put on my feet because I'm going to die your death. I'm going to pay the price for your sin. And far greater than me seeing you under a fig tree, Nathaniel, will be the day that you see me hanging from a bloody tree that I pay the price for every one of your sins. But don't quit and don't give up because you're going to see me put into a grave. But I want to let you know, Nathaniel, my greatest miracle hasn't been done yet because as I'm in that grave, there is no reason to fret because I am waging war with the enemy 
and I am stealing the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And three days later, I will resurrect and all of heaven will be opened up and there will be a pathway for you. Not because of your merit, not because of your good works, not because of your pedigree or your education or your money or your status, but because I am that good. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Yes. Yes. Absolutely yes. This is the gospel. And this is Easter Sunday. This is the day that changed everything. For if Jesus just simply died on that cross, that would make him a martyr. But the fact that he got up out of that grave is an indication he is more than a good teacher. He is God. And at some point, you have to make a decision. You too have to decide what it is that you believe. Do you just think coming here is about the vibes and the atmosphere and let me just go back out there and believe whatever else the rest of the world believes? Or do you actually believe a man lived, paid your price on a cross, died and got up out of that grave? Because I say it this way every year. Listen, if he didn't resurrect, this is one big waste of time. I would say, go to the Soho house. I would say, where, where do the cool people go these days? Alex, I feel like she knows. The Soho house, that's still a thing, okay. Neil, what, the country club, golfing. Adrian, Lifetime. <laughs> Just why would you be here? You should be at Lifetime right now. Have you seen that gym be at Lifetime? Quit giving your money. Quit serving. Quit getting the minivan and getting in the fight with the wife and the kids just trying to get over here. Don't do any of that. You got enough stresses. Don't add on to your stress by trying to play the part of being in a faith community. It's too much work. It's too much effort. If he didn't resurrect. But if he did, get up out of that grave. Where have you been? <laughs> if he did get up out of that grave, what's holding you back? If he did get up out of that grave, when are you going to lift your hands, lift your voice, and tell the whole world of who your God is? If he did, if he did, is there anything more important? If he did, if he did, why would I not give my Saturday in Liberty City? If he did, why would I not be in the grill track? If he did, why would I not be at Vukon? What could be more important than this? And Easter is the day that the church of Jesus comes together and we are reminded of our story. I saw you under that fig tree, but if you'll hang around here, Nathaniel, you're gonna see far greater things. You will see all of heaven opened up and my cross will create a bridge for you to my Father. Can anything good come out of this. Today, maybe you're like Nathaniel. And maybe there's a side of you that, that you want to believe. You're waiting for something. You're doing everything you can to play the part. You're trying to be a good man, a good woman. But somehow, you have a proverbial Nazareth. Something that's blocking you from seeing who Jesus is. I think many times if we're not careful, what we'll miss out on is the thing that we think that negates Jesus is the very thing that validates Jesus. Couldn't come from Nazareth. Oh yeah, it was prophesied about 700 years prior. He had to come from Nazareth. What is negating today your view of Jesus? Hopefully I have enough self-awareness that maybe it's me. Maybe it's this outfit. Maybe it's this style. Maybe it's this tone. Maybe it's this room. Maybe it's the church at large. Maybe it's this church in particular. Maybe it's a person. Maybe it's a place. Maybe it's a thing. I don't know the thing that's negating today, but I wonder, could that very thing be the thing that's validating it? Just because God works with broken people doesn't mean he's broken. In fact, the idea that he works with broken people is a validation that he is merciful. And maybe the thing your soul is thirsty for 
is not perfection, but it's for mercy. And maybe all of my flaws or all of this place's flaws could actually be an indication and a validation that God is still at work. What is your Nazareth? Could good come out of this? Well, Easter would say yes, because out of death and out of the grave came beauty and hope. Could anything good come out of this failed marriage? Could anything good come out of this bankruptcy? Could anything good come out of this failure? Could anything good come out of this tragedy? The answer is yes. Yes, yes, yes. It's what we're banking on. It's what we're believing in. It's Easter. Good can come out of the ashes. I um, celebrated my um, 40th birthday two days ago. Shout out. <laughs> Stick with us because uh, I want to believe that with age, I'm going to get better. <laughs> Some of y'all been on this journey for a while. You're like, I can't believe this man made it to 40. Um, and I got so many really like great gifts from friends. People sent different gifts in, but my favorite, my favorite gift that I got was on um, Thursday morning, my birthday. I came out on my doorstep and there was a package from my friend, Pastor Louis Giglio. And I opened it up. And when I opened it up on the inside was this, uh, copy of the Pilgrim's Progress. And it's really cool because uh, the book, this book is actually an antique. Uh, the inscription on the inside is from 1912. And it was really, really touching to me that I got this book and it really fit with today and this message as I was thinking about it because I don't know if you know the story of the Pilgrim's Progress, but this book that I hold in my hand is the second most sold book in all the world outside of the Bible. And it came from a Puritan preacher by the name of John Bunyan, who lived in the late 1600s. But if you know the story of the Pilgrim's Pro Progress, which has been probably one of the most influential Christian book outside of the Bible for close to 500 years, what you'll know about that book is that book John Bunyan, as he was a Puritan, found himself being put in prison by a corrupt government. And for 11 years, unjustly, he was put into prison. But it was in that prison that God began to speak to him. And out of the prison came Pilgrim's Progress. And when I got it, I said, man, can anything good come out of this moment? Can anything good come out of prison? I would say Pilgrim's Progress could. I think about Helen Keller. Can anything good come out of blindness? Helen Keller did. <laughs> out of slavery came Frederick Douglass. Out of poverty came Abraham Lincoln. Out of utter tragedy did Horatio Spafford coin and write the song, It Is Well With My Soul. Out of a prison cell came the book of Romans. Out of an exiled island of Patmos came the book of Revelation. Out of Nazareth came the savior of the world, Jesus. And out of a grave came hope for humanity. It is the story of resurrection. Can anything good come out of what you're going through? Absolutely, with Jesus. Anything is possible. And if you know the story of Nathaniel, Nathaniel goes on to be a disciple of Jesus. If you say, I haven't seen his name very much, it's because in the other gospels, we know him as Bartholomew. And if you know the story of Bartholomew, you would know that not only did he get converted that day, but all of a sudden the critic named Nathaniel became the radical convert known as Nathaniel. And he went on to spread the gospel and he went on to die a martyr's death. Why? Because if you study anything about the history of the cross, at the cross there was no disciples, there was no apostles, there was no converts, just his mother. They all scattered because they watched their hero die. But three days later, after he resurrected, all of these men, except for Judas, came back together, uneducated, unequipped teenagers. And they spread this message all around the world that today in South Miami and in Miami Gardens and in Little Haiti and Design District, we are still preaching it and teaching it right now. Cowards at the cross, but courageous after the resurrection. 
And I want to encourage you today that with Jesus, whatever you're staring at, your proverbial Nazareth, good, something greater can come up out of it. Nathaniel went on to see Jesus resurrect. He went on to spread the gospel. He believed it so much that he died the martyr's death. He didn't just show up one Sunday out of the year. He gave his very life. I'm reminded of Jesus' words to Thomas, John chapter 20, verse 29. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Today, we can't see the physical resurrection with our physical eyes, but I believe that through faith, with our spiritual eyes, we too can believe. And as we believe, there is a blessing. And so on this Easter Sunday, before we worship, before we sing, I wonder, do you believe? I know there's some Phillips in the house that have been inviting people, but today I want to speak to the Nathaniels. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? The answer is the Messiah came out of Nazareth. With your head bowed and your eyes closed today, there's no one looking around. If you're here and you need to be saved, I'm not asking if you need prayer for your aunt or, or prayer for your business or, or a special blessing over this next year of your life. That's not what I'm, we believe in those things, but I'm asking you right now, is your soul saved? Do you know that you are not good no matter how much good you do? Do you understand that without Jesus, you are headed to a place where he is not. In any place that Jesus is not is what I would define as hell. He said, you don't have to go to hell. You can go to heaven. You might not see him physically get up out of that grave, but you can believe in your heart that he is alive and he's here. And with it, there is a blessing. And when Jesus is with you and when God is for you, I'm telling you, no one and nothing can be against you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. There's no one looking around today. If that's you, whether you're in additional seating or you're online, you're at one of our locations, Miami Gardens, or right there at Design District right now, with your head bowed and your eyes closed, if that's you, would you be bold today and say, Rich, that's me. Would you pray for me? I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. On the count of three, would you lift your hand? Hands are already starting to go up in this room. Trust it's happening in our other spaces right now. One, the Bible says today is the day. Two, don't look at your neighbor. It's not about your neighbor. It's between you and Jesus. One, two, three. If that's you, that's me, Rich. That's me. That's me. I'm putting my faith, my trust in Jesus. The critic, now convert. <laughs> the skeptic, now saved. Thank you, God. You can put your hands down. Church, at all of our locations, can we just stand to our feet for a moment? No one's leaving. We're gonna pray this prayer out loud. I want us to lift our hands. And from additional seating to this main room to all of our locations, as we lift our hands, we're gonna pray this prayer, and then we're gonna sing this song out which is about the powerful name of Jesus. And that's why we've gathered today, to give him honor and to give him glory. And so pray this boldly, say, Dear Jesus, today I give you my life. Forgive me. I recognize that I'm not good and I need the one who came to save me to do what only he can do. I'm putting my trust in you. I believe you are who you said that you are. So take my past, I give you my future. I want to follow you all the days of my life. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Hey, this is Rich and Don Sheree Wilkerson, and we want to say thank you so much for watching and engaging with today's content. Maybe today you want to make the decision to follow Jesus. Why don't you pray this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, Today I choose to entrust my life to you. Forgive me of my sins. Make me a new creation. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're celebrating with you the decision that you've made, and we want to walk this journey out alongside you. Yeah, and if you just prayed that prayer, why don't you go ahead and follow the prompts that are on the screen right now? We're so glad that you took some time to watch today's message. Do us a favor. If it encouraged you, if it impacted you, go ahead and share this. And if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to the Voo Church YouTube channel so you can continue to get more content like this. We love you guys, and we're declaring the best is yet to, to come. come.